on Jimmy D and the Wolf Live Podcast. What up? Hey, everybody. Our schedules are whacked. We're supposed to be doing these on Monday. We're a day late. Sorry about that. Hopefully, we can get things a little straighter. But my nephew does a podcast on Scripted Banner. Check it out. And based on my understanding and my observation, he is he violates the scheduling more than he meets it. Sorry, Seth. <laughs> the worst part that we missed last week is that you, you were in Indiana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We could have done it flat with each other. But uh, <laughs> glad to be here now. And uh, if you're, there's a whole slew of them that haven't been put up on the on the podcasting program, and uh, there's a reason for that. We got to get a. There's just kind of steps of summarizing them. Got to watch them and summarize them. Anybody want to volunteer to do that? Yeah, if you'd like to volunteer to edit our videos and post them to YouTube. This <laughs> and uh, what what's We'll give you a free uh, Tim Wolf pop socket. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So what's been going on? Man, I, as much as I hate to admit it, I've been watching a lot of TV. I don't normally watch much television, but I'm probably the last person in the country to discover the show Pawn Stars, and I just watched... I just watched this series, uh, The Last Dance, about Michael Jordan, which was incredible because I despise Jordan being an NBA fan and not standing uh, for many reasons. It's sort of like that thing, like the the Tom Brady effect, you know? I wanted the Patriots to win their first Super Bowl, and then after that, I just wanted to see them lose every time. Like, it's a funny thing with people, man. Once you're a winner, start winning like if you're a perennial winner everybody wants to see you fail and i always had that thing with jordan where it was like i, I couldn't stand him because i knew he was gonna win and especially because he beat our pacers in the eastern conference championship and the greatest pacer team we ever had that should have won because we were stacked that season we had mark jackson and reggie and the davis brothers rick smiths they were Stacked. It was like the best Pacers team ever in Jordan's basically. And you had Larry Bird, amazing coach. Yeah, Larry Bird was the coach. He's worked wonders with the Pacers, man. But it's funny because they showed it, and I think you may have mentioned this too, they showed it on the series of when Reggie hits the shot and there's like one second left and everybody on the Pacers sideline is going crazy. And then the camera pans to Larry Bird, and Larry Bird is like, because <laughs> he knew. He's like, man, like an 85% chance Jordan's going to make this sh shot with one second. And he did, and he beat us. But I've always really strongly disliked Jordan until watching that series. And it's it's hard not to love the guy, man. He's just such a competitor. and. He loved the game so much that you'd see him get teared up while he was talking about it. And I, I have a newfound respect for him, kind of like I did Tom Brady when I saw uh, some interviews with Brady where he would talk about his dad and he'd get all emotional and teared up. How can you not respect those guys, man? You know, just fierce com competitors. Yeah, and I remember when his dad – I mean, yes, I finished the series myself as well. And it took me a while, even though I'm a huge NBA fan, everybody was talking about it when I first went live. And I put it off because, for just like you, I he beat the teams that I was rooting for. Right. And, I wanted, and I wanted him – I didn't want him to succeed. And I was at some of those games. I was in uh, sales at the time with a Pat and Spence account. And I remember one of my customers, one of the buyers of one of our major customers in Chicago or uh, close to Chicago, was a huge – was a huge Bulls fan. And the second year, when they won the second one, whichever year that was, 91, 92, whatever year that was, I had tickets to the game. And it was the first game of that series, the finals. I think it cost $500. It was pretty close. It was like Roar, Roar 5. It was on the end behind the bucket. 
behind the basket. And that was the basket that, that uh, Jordan put in those seven or eight threes in the first half. And then he goes, he goes like this, you know, that game, I was at that game with, Not- with my, uh, with my customer company paid for it, my expense account. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was amazing to be there. I mean, Jordan was amazing. I mean, what, where was I going with that? But, uh, yeah, he was – I still didn't want him to lose. I was living in New York at the time. And the Celtics were nothing as a team. There was a 20-year black hole there. And I was rooting for the Celtics. I actually had tickets to the Celtics. And I remember – well, I remember when Reggie got, like, eight points in eight seconds. Right. <laughs> Bagger. <laughs> Next, man. I think I was at that game also because I had many season tickets. They weren't full season, but um, a buddy and I that I worked with, or coworker, and I went in on it, and it was uh, it was an experience to be there because a lot of celebrities, uh, you you could we we had nosebleed seats way up, but you could get your binoculars and see all the celebrities on the front row. And remember, uh, especially the Knicks. Yeah, New York City. I mean, you know, that's a lot of a lot of big stars there. You know, I remember uh, Stone. What's her name? Uh, the girl, Sharon. Who, Sharon Stone. Sharon Stone was. I remember seeing her there. You know, and uh, of course, a lot, a lot of big stars. It was just fun and interesting. But Jordan would come to town, and uh, of course, that those two years, Jordan was retired when I was in New York. And yeah. say that again. You you cut out there. He was playing baseball. He's playing baseball, you know, and uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I love that series. It, it really gave me a newfound respect. I mean, for the guy, I mean, he's he's serious, and it was really interesting. I loved how they would show him an iPad with what other people had said for the document documentary, and uh, great. It's like they got all this information from everybody else, and then brought it to him. Yeah. So. Him relive it and then hearing his side of the story was great, man. And uh, especially like the Pittman stuff with Isaiah Thomas. That's when I was really starting to get into basketball. I mean, the Pistons were the Pistons were king when I started watching basketball about 11 or 12 years old. It was the bad boys, you know. And uh, just hearing his take on that, I think they kind of turned him into the monster that he became because they just beat beat him up you know so over and over and over again he was getting beat up i think it helped develop his mentality yeah yeah i mean everybody has to overcome you know some i mean people push to overcome something and and uh and then that makes them a better person i mean the 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 the, uh the pistons had to overcome the celtics they kept getting beat by the celtics when the big three were aging you know uh and of course, I'm a Celtics fan. And finally, they did beat them, you know. And then they went on to win two. When they finally got through the Celtics, they won two in a row. They were two. They were repeat, I believe, right? Weren't they? The Pistons were repeat. Of course, they also defeated the Bulls then too. The Bulls were ascending. And uh, I saw uh, Jordan come to the Garden, the old Garden, back in the day when he had an obstructed view seats. And you could get them if my memory serves five bucks the day of the game, five bucks for a seat. Obstructive view because they had these old pillars. It was not well designed. It was an old building. And of course, by the second half, people would leave and you could move down to better seats. I'm sure you couldn't do that in a playoff game. But and it was a game against the Bulls. And Jordan was so flashy and he had 40 points. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh. And then, of course, my. Larry Bird was my guy, and I said, where's Larry? How come he's not getting points? And I looked at the stats, and he had quietly gotten 45 points. <laughs> but watching the game, it, yeah, it didn't seem like he had scored much because Jordan was so flashy. Right. You know, I was, like, shocked when I, Larry got more than, than than Michael. Just it just the way – yeah, I was at that game. I was privileged to be at that game. Paying five bucks for the seat, can you imagine it? That would never happen today. That's amazing. When I was when I was uh, a little boy, we didn't have much money, but my brother would take me to uh, Indianapolis Colts games because the, it was six bucks a ticket back then. Ah, but we 
we had the worst football team, man. When I was little, I remember we were one and fifteen one season and two and fourteen the next. We were just terrible. So you could you could go up there and get good seats for six bucks a pop from scalpers. Like you didn't even have to buy them beforehand. You could just show up to the stadium and still get them for six dollars. And and like two thirds of the stadium would be empty because we were so bad. They just weren't good forever and ever and ever. And you know, kind of like the what Jordan did for the Bulls. Peyton yeah. did that. We were garbage for a long time, man. It just it was a failing franchise. And he's like Jordan sort of single handedly brought the Bulls back. Peyton single handedly kind of brought the Colts back. You know? yeah. Well, on to another series. What was the other series you said you just watched? You said On Stars. On Stars, yeah. Yeah, yeah when well, I was I there, watched you watched some of that. You had not gotten into that much before? No, no. And what's funny is uh, my wife's seen every single one of them. But what's really funny is Marshall, my 11-year-old son, he's all about it. He watched it with me the other night, and he was super into it. So it's, you know, it's kind of a big deal for me because – you find something that one of your kids is into that you're into with the generation gap. Those things are few and far between yeah. sometimes. None of my kids are really into music or, you know. Yeah. I, my- yeah. I like those guys, you know, uh, and Rick, I've seen interviews of him and even, I think they're still making them. It's like five years ago. He was very modest about it. He said, you know, we, we got lucky and we know this is going to have a finite end point. You know, people get tired of it. Uh, you know, like take a show, Duck Dynasty. Uh, yeah, Duck Dynasty was a huge show, right. and now they're done. You know, and who even thinks of them now? I mean, they're you know, you have your right. It's like music stars. Most music stars, you have your place near the sun, and maybe it's short lived, or maybe it's a little longer. But you know, it's fleeting. Yeah. Fame is fleeting, and he recognized that. He said, "We're going to enjoy it while we can. Cash in. It's a big money making thing." But we know it isn't going to last that long. Uh, uh, but it's continued to last, which is amazing. And then the old man died, you know, uh, he was awesome. And, um, yeah, they just unique characters. Chumley, uh, Chumley is Chumley. I mean, um, uh, he's got a lost he, ton. Of, sorry. Those guys have lost a ton of weight. Yeah. Chumley and his, his buddy, the, the, the son, number three, uh, I've forgotten their names, but, uh, big boss, big hoss. Corey, Corey. Yeah. Corey. Oh, and uh, the knowledge that Rick has on a lot of subjects. I mean, you can't snow him. If you're talking about historical military things or uh, many other things, he'll he just, well, of course, I mean, you got to recognize reality television is not reality television. A lot of it is scripted and a lot of it is planned. And maybe they say, okay, you got this to sell. You're going to come in on this day. And, and Rick has already looked up all the information. I do recognize that, that stuff goes on. I don't know. But I believe that he does have a really good uh, education. A lot of these things. It's that's that's who that guy really is. I mean, he might have his cheat sheets, but that's who that guy really is. It's not like the Duck Dynasty thing. I couldn't watch that. My brother got real into it. I couldn't watch it because it just seemed disingenuous. I just like that wasn't who those guys really were when the camera wasn't on them. It, to me, it was a facade, you know. But Pawn Star. Cool, because that's who. Yeah, know, it's that's who those guys are. It's legit, and it comes across, and that's why it's holding up. I think and there's another like, show I found, and they've got the recipe. I mean, today, if you're going to be successful, uh, you got to have you know, sex always sells. It always has, and it always will. You get a beautiful woman, and there's a show. I can't even remember what it's called now, but it's in California, and I binge watched the entire season. They're going to have another one. Constance Nunes is the woman on it. And she's, I mean, she's model, gorgeous, just stunningly hot. And she is the woman in this in the garage. Literally, if you believe what they're what they're pushing, she's the one who rebuilds the engines. There's four of them. I can't remember the name uh, of the show, but I remember her name. I started following her on Instagram, and she's posing with these. You know, she's like the pinup on the car, but she's also the one who built the car. So that's 2020, you know, women can do anything. Whereas it used to be, you know, the pinup was just this uh, beautiful woman who couldn't do anything. You know, that was probably the 50s, 60s, 70s, different generation. But now, you know, you got beautiful guitar, beautiful women who are wailing on guitar or whatever it is. And that's awesome. I love that. 
So anyway, that I can't remember the name of that show, but uh, Rust to something maybe. Um, well, yeah. The, the statistic about you threw that at me, and I didn't know it. Was it one third of the new guitar buyers are females? Something like that? Oh no, over half. Over half. It's amazing. Over half. Yeah. So over half. People the, that guys, are the, young guys, the young guys are all um okay. Yeah, I knew there I got points for Tim. I remember there was Rust in the name. It's called Car Masters Rust to Riches. Constance News is Amer Noons. Constance Noons is an American model and reality TV personality of Portuguese descent. Born and raised in LA, she's known for extensive experience in the automotive industry and starring in Netflix series Car Masters, Rust to Riches. And they, it's really interesting. I mean, again, I don't know how much of it is uh, planned out, but they find these cars and they mod them big time, change them, and then they sell them and trade them for the raw material to go to the next level. And they're constantly looking for trading. They're, they buy something at a lower end that they can afford and they put money into it bring it up to a level, cost customized, trade that to somebody who has another raw material beat up Hulk that they can, that's not more expensive as a, is at that level. And they continue ratcheting up until they get to a six figure car. And then they sell that. And that's the plan. I mean, it seems you got to really know your market because when you get Absolutely. customized stuff, I mean, customized stuff, it rarely brings what you have to pay, I think, to build it. Uh, like here's an example in the news right now. Sylvester Stallone spent four hundred fifty thousand dollars customizing an SUV, stretching it. I think it's a, I think it's a Cadillac Esplanade, customized four hundred fifty thousand dollars, and he's trying to sell it for three fifty, and apparently not being able to. And it's got his name on it. So once you get into the customized realm, I feel that it's very you know rare error. It's, yeah, it's just like, it's, just like you can, and same thing with guitars. Sure. You start to mess with the the original uh, elements of the guitar, you destroy the value. Yeah. Mods are a big number. What is that? There's one behind you that I can't identify, Tim. There's a guitar behind you, and it's driving me insane that I can't identify it. Which one? Is it back by the couch? Where it's is it? behind your left shoulder in plain view. What is that? I think that's my... Uh, oh. This one? That one. All right. Yeah. This one is, uh, there's a guy named, this is called Bad. This is made in Japan. It's an interesting, it's a kind of a mashup between a, uh, uh, a Fender, Fender and a, a Les Paul or, you know, Paul, Paul Reed Smith. It's got humbuckers, but it's got a bolt on neck. So, and the scale length, I believe, is of I got to measure it, but I'm pretty sure it's a Fender scale length. I'm sorry, uh, a Les Paul scale length, so 24 and three quarter, or it might be a 25. I think the Paul Reed Smiths are 25, aren't they? They're just yeah, a quarter they're inch longer. Versus a Strat is 25 and a half, right? Just and the difference in that little bit of difference makes for a completely different yeah. sound. Yeah, you know, more jangly the Strat, and the bolt-on neck makes it more jangly. So you got the bolt-on neck with the and it's got it. It's more of a shredder body. This um, interesting story. There's a guy named Toshio. He's a, a luthier in Japan, Toshio. And I can't remember his last name, but people know him by Toshio. And he's a base builder, Bosa Basis. And Bosa is a custom base builder. I mean, they go for four figures, four, you know, two to 5,000, I think. And uh, there are people who love, you get on and you Google it, there are people who love his bases. And he, um, my friend Shuji, Shuji Kobayashi, who lives in Japan, uh, is a guitar player. Um, and he, uh, I haven't seen uh, Shuji in a long time, but I uh, used to hang out with him a lot when I lived in Japan. And uh, he's got a 65 strap. Nice. Was, you know, he was born in 65, and so he, he wanted to get, he get that. He's a, Eric Johnson. He loves everything, everything Eric oh, Johnson. About that guy. Yeah, I've told you about him. He's a great guy, great guy. 
Uh, anyway, um, he helped. Uh, Toshi was down on his luck financially. And this is a red flag that that I probably wouldn't have noticed and he didn't notice. So Shuji went in and started a company with with Toshio. And he wanted to find a new name for it. And he had gone to like the NAM show. And uh, the story goes how he picked the name. It's B-A-D-D, -D, bad. And he would show his Bosa bases and these base players would come and they said, that's bad, man, that's bad. And, you know, Toshio's English is not the best and he's, he knows bad is not good. Right. You, you don't like my base? You don't like? Exactly. The guy explained, no, that means it's good. Yeah. Oh, that means it's good. I will name my new guitar back guitars. English language where every word means nine different things. So that's the name of this guitar. And it's uh, – he wound his own. I mean, these these pickups are bad pickups. He wound his own pickups, and this is uh, quilted maple. I mean, this this is I've had this guitar for a, a long time, but this beautiful quilted maple I, maple I picked out the color and everything. And I think this was the first one they made. I told Shuji when you were making these, I want to be the first, the very first guitar that you made. And I remember I met him, and it was up. It was in a, a room or apartment above. Uh, Shuji's a hair hair cutter, has a hair salon, which is a high end thing in Japan. I mean, it's expensive to get your hair cut because they have very expensive. Their scissors cost like a hundred bucks a piece or more. I mean, they're very serious about the craft of cutting hair. I mean, there's no there's no you know great clips, or there wasn't in Japan. I mean, you you get your hair cut. It's a craftsperson who has really studied it. Anyway, so it was above, and I met Toshio, and and he had guitar parts laying all around. And he built the guitar and I bought it. And uh, the problem is Toshio, I mean, it's common knowledge if you Google it now, he's got some major, I guess, addiction issues or something. And he, um, he owed a lot of money to uh, mob figures. And uh -huh. he was stealing from Shuji. And Shuji ended up having to sell his car to pay the debt. And I think Shuji, if you even mention uh, he probably uh, they separated, of course, on really bad terms. And I heard that Toshio was homeless for a while, this guitar builder. But I noticed that there's now Bosa guitars being Bosa bases being made. So he's back in business and he may not even be alive anymore. I don't know how old he is, but that's the story of this guitar maker. I mean, it's still a great guitar. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, there are people who uh, Shuji told me when he was still in business that the pickups were starting to get some rep, some. Uh, some reputation in Japan and people were wanting the pickups, just the pickups alone. So um, it's got coil splits. You can split each, each coil, single, single or double coil. Um, so, you know, the design is kind of a, it's a very design. The, the body is, I would say a very Japanese design, you know, yeah. isn't it? I mean, you know, just the way the upper bout is, you know, and it's super wide. This lower bout is super wide. It doesn't fit in most hard cases. I bought a hard case for it, and it wouldn't fit in it because it's much wider than a, a Les Paul. Look how wide that, that bottom bout is, you know, this, this area right here. You know, so it's a special guitar, uh, and especially because my buddy, it was his company, and I think it was the first one they made, the first one they sold, you know, and uh means a lot to me. For a while, it was my number one guitar. I was playing it all the time. Uh, in the bands I was in, and I haven't played it too much. Um, I've been playing my Strat recently, but I brought it out recently for a solo I did on a video. A recent song I did, I did, I did it in a. Uh, I used this guitar, so that's my bad guitar. I think there's a my bad guitar. I think there's a general consensus amongst uh, players that. You know the the only kind of guitars that hold it. American guitars are Japanese guitars. They have Boy, you're really breaking up. I hope I don't hope I hope it's on the recording, but say that again. Excuse me. Please say that again. I was just saying that I think Japanese made guitars are have a have a great reputation amongst players, as you know. That you know, if you want something affordable, it's a great go-to guitar by Japanese. 
Yeah, the made in Japan fenders are, uh, I think, high high regarded, right? Highly well, regarded. In that era, you know, in the in the early and mid eighties, they're better than the American made fenders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. American stuff was really a lot a lot of crap. Um, so thank you for asking about my bad guitar. I uh, I haven't been giving it much love. I, now I'm thinking of uh, I need to play it more. I mean, even the headstock. Look at look at the. He's got maple. There's maple. You know, there's quilted maple even on the the detailer that's laminated on the headstock there's that's can you see that yeah that's the, he put the same quilted maple that's on the laminated on the top of the body with the top of the headstock although it's it's natural colored but i mean look at that i mean there's it's ornate yeah you know so dot inlays but uh yeah i i do i do love my bad guitar um, I so, didn't remember. Say it again. I didn't remember that one. Oh, you didn't? Okay. Well, I might have had it behind the green screen, which I am going to. Uh, I'm going to get rid of that and have a green screen that comes down from the ceiling and then retracts. That is my plan to buy a, a, a green screen that it'll be better. I won't have the wrinkles in it, and I won't have to edit that out. Something editing it out is a pain uh, when you get to the post production thing so i'm gonna advance my advance my tools always stepping up another level trying to always advance percent. you know so anyway uh another uh another thing that i just watched and i realized that i'd watched it before it's on netflix it's a four-hour series on bob dylan and it's about his early years and I thought, man, this looks awful familiar. And I, it came out in 2005, and I must have rented the DVD or maybe even have the DVD in a box somewhere because I know I've seen it. And what's really, and it's really interesting of his how he came up. Now he's from Minnesota, he being Minnesota, and I'm from South Dakota, so that's the next state over. And uh, it talks about his early influences and how he started off doing all the covers, all the folk songs, and Woody Guthrie, and then he started writing and. Uh, you know, everybody knows who Bob Dylan is, but the early, how he, how he accelerated. And uh, there was even talk about, he went to New York and he came when he, uh, he was only gone a year or maybe even less than a year. When he came back, there was talk that he did a Robert Johnson deal where he made a deal with the devil. And a lot of these great heroes have that period. Jimi Hendrix had, it, right? I mean, it was about a year that Hendrix was a, just an average guitar player. I mean, you'd know more about Hendrix than I do. But he came back. He was in Nashville, I believe, in the military, and he studied under someone. You, uh, and he came back, and he was at this whole other level. Yeah. And Dylan had the same kind of effect. People that knew him in Minneapolis. Well, he moved to he went from Hibbing to Minneapolis. Hibbing is small town, nothing there. And uh, then he went to New York, and he was there for probably less than a year. It was a big folk scene, and he came when he came back and played in Minneapolis, they're like, this guy's at a whole nother level. So it's just kind of interesting how people go away and come back. Well, they commit all the way to their craft. You know, those guys, they go all in with it. They, they, there's nothing else on their plate. And that's what Dylan did, and that's what Robert Johnson did, and that's what Hendrix did. You know, it, it's amazing how much ground you can cover, how far you can go quickly when it's just all about that, when you're not worried about paying bills or anything like that, you're just honed in on your craft. And I think that's what those guys did. And yeah. we all, know it. it's like when you see an unbelievable musician, every musician knows it's time. It's time. Yeah. It's no mystery to any of us. I mean, I don't watch like Tommy Emanuel play guitar and go, Oh, how did he do that? I know exactly how he's playing a guitar for 12 hours a day. Yeah. You know? Those guys just go all in, and we understand that now, but I would imagine, especially the Robert Johnson thing, I think that's why there's so much folklore around it, that it was unknown to the masses. That that whole style of guitar playing was unknown to the masses. So he got it from different people. You know, there are other people playing finger style and, yeah, there's. I've read some articles about the, of some of the people, individuals that they think he might have, uh, he might have uh, gotten instruction from, and yeah. I, I don't remember the names. Same with Hendrix. There was some one or two individuals in Nashville that he got instruction from, wasn't there? 
Yeah, Johnny Johnson was one of them. There was a blues guy in Nashville named Johnny Johnson, and Hendrix would always go listen to Lenny Bro play. And Lenny Bro was an incredibly knowledgeable guitar player, and Hendrix would go listen to him and study him. And a lot of his influence came from different places, like the funk guys, you know. Ike Turner and Curtis Mayfield were big influences on him. Yeah, I know Mayfield was. I love Mayfield's playing. And, and a buddy guy, too, you know. Mayfield had a horrible accident when a lighting rig fell on him and paralyzed him from the neck down, was it? Yeah. He couldn't play guitar anymore. That's horrible. Yeah. Uh, player, man. I mean, great rhythm, great rhythmic concepts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. So anyway, talking about Dylan, one, you know, it had a bunch of concert footage when he went, uh, when he went electric and um, he got booed. He had first. He had Bloomfield behind him. Mike Bloomfield playing lead, at least bluesy things. So far away from folk, and you can hear people shouting at him, "Judas, traitor!" Right. You can clearly hear people saying it. You know, and he was so stressed out. And then he got the band after first. He had the band with L. Cooper in it, which who was a lot. The band uh, L. Cooper and and Mike Bloomfield, all those guys from Chicago. And and then he had the band with him after, and uh, after he got done with the tour, he literally and some of the questions he got asked were really funny and how he would respond. He had no patience for all these people sticking a microphone in his in his face and and asking him um, really stupid questions. Do you like the music you play? Someone asked him, and it was Not so right. interesting. <laughs> right. uh, so yeah, it was. Uh, after he got done with the tours he was committed to, he's he kept saying, I can't wait to go home. And he literally didn't tour for eight years. He was burned out with it. It really affected him. And he said, man, I can't stand the booing, man. You have him in the in the bus afterwards. And he said, man, that booing, I can't stand it. I need a new, he even said one time, I need a new Dylan. I need a new Bob Dylan. I'm going to use him really hard. Give me a new Bob Dylan. <laughs> Let him go out and do that. I don't want to do it myself anymore. <laughs> Well, it just goes to show, man, that, you know, with anything, if it's if it's music or visual art or tech or science, anything you're doing, if you're innovating, you're taking chances. And if you're taking chances, there's some people that just aren't going to be happy with what you're doing. And especially today where people have voices on the Internet, you can you can post it and, and just crucify people. I mean, a lot of artists have been greatly hurt by it. I mean, Absolutely. Uh, even Ed Sheeran, he's off Twitter because it was too too tough and rough. I mean, uh, you know, Taylor Swift, a lot of haters, a lot of haters on Taylor Swift. You know, yeah. there's some songs about it, Shake It Off and some other things. Uh, so everybody has to deal with it. The more you, the more, the, the higher you climb, the more detractors there are going to be. And so. Circle, man. It's, the, it's exactly what we started this podcast with. It's the same thing, you know, when, when the Pistons were, were beating up on Jordan, I rooted for Jordan. Then when Jordan started winning championships, I'm like, I don't want to see him win anymore. And people do the same thing with musical acts and bands. It's like, that's my band, Underground. I love them. That's my band. I feel like yeah. it's special yeah. what everybody else knows about. The, the punk rock kids did when I was in school with Nirvana. They all love Nirvana until they blew up and then they hated them. All yeah. the metal kids. Of Metallica until they blew up, and then Metallica wasn't metal anymore. But it's the same effect, you know. Everybody loves loves you until you start winning consistently. Fast. The one thing about uh, one guy that, I, and I remember this really stuck on me because I remember when I apparently rented this and watched this maybe when it first came out. Uh, L. Cooper. L. Cooper's an interesting cat. Sure. I mean, he was a guitar player. And he was one of the founding members. I think he was the founding force behind Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Yeah. One of my, one of my great, I mean, with a horn band. I mean, I don't think the, the, if it wasn't for Blood, Sweat, and Tears, it wouldn't have been Chicago and some of these other great horn bands. I mean, Blood, Sweat, and Tears was was was, was the shiz, man. I, I love some of the stuff they did. He recorded with Henry, too. Yeah, he did. And then uh, the interesting thing is they were doing a recording for uh, – what was the album that just blew out uh, with the, with the, all the great songs on, like "Ballad of a Thin Man" and um, uh, uh, "Rolling Like a Rolling Stone" and uh, um, 
down on Desolation Row and all those songs, whatever album that was. Highway 61 Revisited, uh, maybe that, that one was a huge album. And then, um, da -da 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 -da. Through the bums of uh, through the bums of dime, didn't you? What song is that? That's uh, that's like a Rolling Stone. So it's got that organ part behind it. If you think of that organ part, so Al Cooper was a guitar player, and they always had a guitar player, and he wanted to be on this recording session. I mean, I give the guy props. He's telling this story, and he said that uh, the guy that was playing the organ, they switched over to piano. So there was an organ there that nobody was playing. He said he didn't know how to play the organ, really, is what he claimed. He obviously did because when he got in there and played the part, it wasn't bad. And uh, and the and the the producer, he says, hey, can I go in and play the organ? And the producer said, you're not an organ player. And then he got the producer got asked the question, and he got distracted. And so Al said, he didn't say no. Al had balls, man. So he goes in, and he sits down at the organ, and he starts playing, and you can even hear when they start doing the cut, the producer's coming over the talk back. Hey, what are you doing in there? <laughs> he's talking to L. I love it. So L plays the parts, and he says, you can always hear I'm like an eighth or a quarter beat behind because I wasn't sure of the chords I was playing. So I would wait to make sure <coughs> what the chord was, and then I would play the part. <clears throat> and afterwards, they're doing the playback, and Bob's in the playback. Now, Bob's a star. He's a rock star by this time. And he's, they're playing it back, and Bob goes, Bob Dylan goes, turn up that organ. And the producer goes, he's not an organ player. And Bob goes, I don't care. I like it. Turn it up. And now it's an iconic part of that track. I and mean, you, you, the organ is very prevalent in uh, Like a Rolling Stone. Sure. I remember the line. I'm, I can hear it when you bring it up. That was Al Cooper fumbling his way on an organ. <laughs> Hey, it's the extra make it special, man. Yeah, you know, so uh yeah, a little classic rock stuff there. That's great. Well, one more thing that I uh stumbled across today. You're familiar with Patreon. In fact, you have a Patreon account. I do. And Patreon is for those of you who don't know, is a site that was started by a guy named Jack Conti, who's a musician. And he's got a band called, he and his wife have a band called Pomplamoose, and they're out of California, and they do covers, interesting covers, interesting uh, covers. And they really blew up. They've got millions of followers on YouTube. They really blew up when they uh, had the cover of Taylor Swift's song that won the, the uh, video award when Kanye West tried to steal, tried to pull the, the statue off of, out of her hands. She was just a, you know, innocent teenager and everybody, you know, oh, poor Taylor. And because he thought that Beyonce should have won the award. And so he went up there and tried to pull off her hands. You remember that. And the song, they had covered that song or the Beyonce song. I don't remember which. One of the songs that was in play there, they had covered it. And suddenly it, when people were searching for the song, their cover came up and they got like <clears throat> 100,000 followers out of that just because they happened to have covered that song and they were in the right place at the right time. And that boosted their career. And they do really great videos. It's absolutely amazing the videos that they do. And he started P Patreon, Patreon because artists have always through the history have relied on patrons. I mean, if you go back to the Renaissance period, Michelangelo and uh, all of those cats, you know, they had patrons. They would be hired by, maybe it would be a church, it would be a Pope. It could be a private person. The Medici's would, were patrons and artists of all sorts have always, and classical artists, classical composers, Bach, Beethoven, they had patrons who would pay them to create symphonies for them. That's how they, that's how they survived and made money. It's been a fact of life for artists for many years, for many centuries. And so he said, let's modernize that and let's have a call it a Patreon, which I, is probably a French way or, or Spanish way of saying patron, P-A-R-T-R-O-N, and you put the E in there, patron. It's, maybe it's Spanish. And that was, the, so you have artists go on there and you uh, you sign up, you have an account and people can uh, subscribe for a certain amount of money. There's different levels 
and you get content that's not available anywhere else, whether it be private concerts or it could be anything. And he's been doing this for like 10 or 15 years, I believe. Uh, been some time, Jack Conti. So he also has Pomplamoose, and so he's a musician. Now he's got, I sent you a, a link to one of his deals uh, where he did, he did a funk cover, phenomenal, phenomenal. Uh, what was that song? Did you see that? I sent that to you. It's a funk cover of a song, live in the studio. Anyway, I came across this where he, now it's not limited to musicians. You can be any kind of artist. You can even be a comedian. You can be a, a, a painter. And there's this guy I'd never heard of. His name is Owen Benjamin. And he, have you heard of Owen Benjamin? No. He's a comedian, I guess. And he is a uh, alternative comedian. He, and he's a, I mean, trying to state it factually without upsetting anyone. He's, he's he got some very conservative right wing beliefs. Like he has spoken at, there's a flat earth conference and he's spoken there, whether it's for comedy or not. He, he has made comments that he thinks slavery should brought, be brought back. He, um, some extremely, you know, non-mainstream comments and beliefs. Now, whether he's doing it for the effect of comedy, I mean, there's always that, that attack of, oh, I was only saying that to, to own the, the opponents. You know, there's always that method of defending. Uh, I wasn't serious. It was a joke. I, I don't know where he fits in that, but so everybody has banned his videos. Everybody meaning Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and Patreon also kicked him off the platform. And um, he, in fact, apparently he said that he's not even really that big on Patreon. He even forgot that he had a Patreon account, but he's got some rabid followers. And so he, <clears throat> I just read about this this morning because it was amazing to me. Patreon may no longer be no more because they, they have terms of service and it's controversial how they handle it. Maybe they didn't handle it that well. They kicked him off because they didn't want what they said, hate speech. They said his stuff was hate speech. Well, all the other platforms kicked off. Now, unfortunately, they're not as big as Twitter. I mean, he's, he's not going to put a dent in, in Google or uh, Twitter or Facebook. I mean, he can, you know, he can sue him for millions of dollars. Mark Zuckerberg will laugh at that, you know, I, I suppose. But Patreon is not a big company. It's, it's this musician guy who's not really a businessman. Historically, I think he's trained as a musician. And they have as their terms of service that you, if you use their site, that they, you can't sue them, you have to go into arbitration. Now, coincidentally with that, in the state of California where they do business, there's a new law that got passed that said that if you go into arbitration, um, and if it's a, a dispute between an individual and a company, the company has to pay almost the, all the fees for arbitration. Now, arbitration, people think, well, you know, that's going to be cheaper. You can't sue me. Well, the thing about it is it's all private and it's nothing is covered. Now, if you go into a, a courtroom, the judge is paid for by the U.S. government. The, the courthouse is paid for by the U.S. government. There's a lot of mechan There's a lot of supporting things that go into when when you have a, a lawsuit in the U.S. crime system. But if you go, if you elect to go into the system of arbitration, all those costs have to be covered by the arbitrators. And so, and the law in California said that almost all of it has to be covered by the corporation if it's an individual against the corporation. This is a new law in California. So you take that and this Owen Benjamin apparently reached out to, he's got some rabid followers and he said, I need a hundred of you to each file a arbitration case against Patreon. Because um, users are not only the content creators, but also the end users that pay the money. They, they define them both as users. So both can apparently file, file an arbitration case. <coughs> so each arbitration case could cost <coughs> easily $10,000. And, you know, $10,000, I mean, 10 would be 100,000, 100 would be a million. And so that's a million dollars potentially that could go that uh, Patreon would have to pay. I don't know what their income is, how big a company they are, but they're definitely not big tech. It's a small company that was started by uh, Jack Conti. Um, so 
there's now talks, there's a lot of articles about it, and they've had a ruling, uh, a judge ruled against their, they tried to get a cease and desist against all these, and this Owen Benjamin actually funded, supposedly funded, $25,000 funded anyone who would, any of his fans who would do a, a case against Patreon. So. Terrible. <laughs> So it's interesting stuff. I mean, uh, Patreon could be no more. Or Owen Benjamin could own it. <laughs> I've never heard of Owen Benjamin, but he apparently it's, uh, what's it called? Owen and the Bears, and his supporters are called Bears. And, uh, you know, uh, you read some of the stuff they're talking about, the Jews. You know, they openly say in the articles, the Jews that own social media. It's like uh, it's, a, it's a group of people. Uh, conspiracy. I mean, it's just like flat earth again, you know, flat earth. I mean, there's a convention for flat earth. I mean, I'm just curious to go there and just, you know, incognito and see what they talk about. I mean, you could easily, you know, if there is a flat earth, why doesn't somebody go to the edge and take pictures of it? I mean, crazy. you can literally fly around the world. You know, you literally can get on a plane, fly around the world. Um, <laughs> I'm just amazed, just amazed, you know, uh, now are they just trolling people? I mean, that's probably the defense, you know, that's, that's a well-used defense. Oh, it was all a joke and we're just troll trolling you libs, you know, uh, but. <laughs> Insane. <laughs> uh, now I, he spoke there. I don't know if he was, if he supports it, but, um, if he was just making comedy, I mean, you know, he lives in that comedy area, uh, I he, guess. Just making money. He's just money. Believes it or not, he's tapped into his audience. Could be. I don't Bat, know. Bat has an audience. No, so uh, he's got rabid fans. I mean, there's Reddit, there's Reddit subreddits that are based are just on this subject. <clears throat> Patreon versus Owen Benjamin. There's entire subreddit forums where people are posting. I mean, it's, and I'm amazed that I only came across it this morning because I was on, I happened to come across another artist that I follow and he had posted a video. Apparently he just started a Patreon account and he posted a video uh, saying, Hey, join my Patreon account. You know, it was up, like if you would post a video saying, Hey, here's my Patreon account. This is what we're going to be doing. This is going to be offering. Here are the options to opt in. And some of the comments were below. One of the comment was, well, I'm not going to join it. I'm afraid that all the money that goes to Patreon is going to be used for legal fees. I'm like, legal fees? Yeah. Patreon being sued? Somehow it had not reached my level. Of, there's so much information. You can't know everything. And somehow that had not been on any of my news feeds. And uh, so I started Googling it. And I've spent about 45 minutes to an hour deep dive because there's a ton of information about it. It's been going on since the last probably almost a year It's going on with between Patreon and uh, it's in the courts, you know, they're suing outside the arbitrary, even though they're not supposed the, uh, the terms of service are that you can't sue, but now there's lawsuits being filed and counter lawsuits and it's becoming a mess. So, just interesting. It's terrible that, that that a company with the best intentions can be taken down like that. Well, the supporters of uh, one and the bears would say that, you know, we it's free speech. We should be able to say that. So, you know, there's always in different opinions. Yeah. Um, Shame on you guys. <laughs> I mean, I don't believe the earth is flat. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, that's only part of it. Uh, Anti-Semitism is a problem. I mean, that's what started World War II. You know, and oh, I, he's a Holocaust denier. Owen, Owen, <coughs> Owen Benjamin is a Holocaust denier. It never really happened. I mean, you can go to the camps. You can go to the camps in Germany. They still have his museums, Auschwitz. And uh, guy, Tim. What's that? He sounds like a real sweetheart of a guy. <laughs> uh, yeah. So if you don't study history and know it, you're doomed to repeat it. That's what I'll say about that. And 
it's a real thing. So it's scary. Man. It's scary well, like that get traction. Yeah, it's amazing that that kind of stuff gets traction. I agree on one hundred percent. So, well, can we end on a good note? What do you got for a good note? You got a joke? You got anything? No, I would just like to express to that dude's followers: don't be a terrible person today. <laughs> All right. Patreon was a great platform. Be ashamed if something happened to it. Because I'll really miss that fifteen dollars a month. <laughs> uh, have you been following up and putting special content up on there? I do my best, man. <laughs> Get what you pay for, kind of thing. <laughs> well, um, uh, Chris Green, the coach that I'm taking, Chris Green to manifest. He suggests that you have your own. He's leaving. Patreon, not because of that. I don't think he never mentioned that, but he said that he's moving in all the click funnels and having his control of it himself. He'll have his own because Patreon does take 30%. Sure. I think, is it 30%? They take a percentage. So yeah. people, I could be making like $18 a month. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel, I feel cheated all of a sudden. <laughs> all right. Should we call it? Let's call it, man. Good to see All you. Right. Jimmy D. the Wolf. See you next time.